makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Joe Biden defends his mental fitness after a Justice Department report adds to concerns about the U.S. president's age. U.S. stocks hit another record with the S&P briefly topping 5,000 for the first time. The next catalyst for markets, CPI revisions later today. Plus, L'Oréal slumps after sales disappoint, hit by weak demand from Chinese travelers. But Hermès surges as it weathers the luxury slowdown. So first thing is first, let's take a look at the European markets map. We actually had quite an interesting week for the markets. If you look at European stocks and bonds for the moment, small moves. Investors really remaining pretty cautious ahead of U.S. inflation data due out later today. Now, if you look at what bond markets have been doing, certainly traders there have spent the week trying to juggle, I guess, a string of well-received U.S. bond sales against this cautious language on rate cuts from central bank policymakers. Now, we did have annual revisions to monthly U.S. inflation data, and that's attracting quite a lot of attention after last year's adjustments are now casting doubt on the Fed's progress in taming inflation consumer prices. Now, President Joe Biden's age and ability is back in the spotlight ahead of the U.S. election. It follows the Department of Justice report into his handling of classified documents, which describes President Biden as an elderly man with a poor memory. The report was led by a former U.S. attorney appointed by Donald Trump, who's likely to be Biden's opponent in the race for the White House. Now, in a hastily arranged press conference on Thursday night, President Biden forcefully defended his memory before mistakenly referring to the Egyptian president as the leader of Mexico. As you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Ross Matheson. Ross, as always, thank you so much for joining. I mean, this is, is pretty extraordinary. Well, that's right. I mean, this is a very consequential election year for the U.S. and possibly this week, looking back, will have been one of the most consequential for Joe Biden. Uh, he's, he's likely to face Donald Trump uh, in, 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 the, in the election. You know, Donald Trump is on a, on a march. He's got momentum in what we've seen so far, despite all the court cases against him. And, and even though they're very close in age, they're both rel relatively elderly men. It's Joe Biden who keeps getting the attention and the questions over his mental capacity to do another term as president. And uh, you saw that very sort of you know, heartfelt response from Joe Biden yesterday. The attacks, could he remember the date that his son died of cancer, for example, and you know, in that report. But at the same time, as he was leaving that press conference, almost out the door, again confused two leaders. He's done that in quick succession. He mixed up the former leaders of Germany recently, of France. You know, he's got a lot going on. He's, he's running the U.S. economy. He's got, you know, he's, the U.S. is sort of semi-involved in wars, uh, both in Ukraine and the Middle East. A lot of challenges. But the U.S. president has to be up to those challenges. And so, essentially, it's just red meat for the Republicans at this point. So uh, what else did we see in the report? I mean, as you say, it just got very, very personal. It did. It was sort of saying he's an elderly man who has mental challenges. And this was more about whether he, you know, knowingly took classified documents and kept classified information. And in a way, that conversation has been overtaken by these comments about his capacity mentally in the report. He's an elderly man who has trouble remembering dates, remembering people, remembering events. And it's less about whether he knowingly did something wrong but his capacity as president and the very personal nature of the comments about whether he could remember the date his son died. And that's really what fired Biden up in that press conference. Ross, how bad is this actually, you know, in terms of polling, in terms of what the American people will do in the election? Is there now a war room where Democrats are, are kind of scratching their heads saying, what do we do next? Is, is he actually going to be the Democratic nominee? Well, there have been lots of those conversations behind the scenes. We know that they're going on and possibly escalating. But we're at the point where it's probably too late to do anything because it's really up to Joe Biden if he wants to run again. It's his choice, his decision. And what he said, and we know going into the previous election, he saw himself as the only person who could beat Donald Trump. Mm 
in the first election. He said that very clearly. He felt he was the only one who could do it. And given it's going to be Donald Trump more than likely again, no doubt he sees himself as the only Democrat again who could do a repeat. So very much he sees his task here as something that he fundamentally he needs to do. But they can't make him step aside. It's really up to Joe Biden and he seems determined to continue. I mean, did, did the report come as a surprise? Because the, the press conference seemed to be arranged quite hastily. It seems that the, the sort of the comments again about his age and his mental capacity came as a surprise. I mean, there's nothing in that report that suggests that Joe Biden is going to be charged with, him, with anything. And again, the focus was supposed to be on these on these documents and the classified information. But that really seems to have taken them by surprise. Hence the response last night. Yes, such a big story. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Our Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Ross Matheson. Now, we're also joined by Eric Nielsen, Group Chief Economist Advisor at Unicredit. And Eric's thinking, I'm so glad I'm not in politics right now because I wouldn't yes. probably know what to do with this. But, I mean, th this could actually change, I guess, the face of an election. And so this could change the economy and, and certainly what happens to the rest of the world. Yes. I mean, it's a, as, as Ross said, it's, it's hugely consequential, right? I mean, there's a... It's two different visions of America and two different visions of America in the world. So it's very easy to, as far as I can see, among investors and clients of ours and ourselves, it's very easy to be caught up in the dislike of Trump and all the, the, the things that he says and the behaviors and all the rest of it. Um, but when you think about what policies might follow from a Trump, second Trump presidency, it doesn't look good uh, for Europe for sure, right? Um, most people I speak to think that because of the Heritage re uh, Report that you could see some very big tariffs, for example, uh, a big fiscal boost uh, via tax cuts to the corporates. That could boost America short term, not long term, right? But for Europe particularly and for Asia, the rest of the world really, this is uh, a very yeah. scary outlook. If you look, Eric, and you have been such a champion, actually, of, I guess, European values and integration, yeah. right? Yeah. I think it's fair yeah. to say that. If you're Europe right now and we have European elections, you know, are they rethinking in Brussels the leadership of Europe to somehow counter that? If you speak to them, I was just in Luxembourg earlier this week and uh, saw a number of policymakers uh, uh, who had gathered there for, for a big uh, event. The answer is yes. There's a, there's a lot of talk about the need for more uh, uh, military or defense spending. There's a lot of understanding of the, of the climate change, the, the demographic challenges in Europe. Um, but there is no, I sense no strategic top-down appreciation for what it takes. So this is, this is my big, big uh, concern. One thing I would say that I came away with a little bit relieved was for the first time, there was a clear, at the top level, there was a clear appreciation now, understanding and knowledge that Europe has vastly underperformed America for almost two years now. Mm -hmm. Vastly. Like one of the biggest divergence for, for, for decades. Mm -hmm. And this, the question has started then to emerge, why? I don't think they got the and, answer. And, and why? I mean, is it also, yeah. I mean, Germany is also, frankly, not doing great. Right. No, right? sure. sure. So, so, so that's, there's that aspect in, within Europe. The, 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 the tables have turned, right? Now Italy and Spain are looking pretty good, Germany looking poor, right? So, so it has they shifted. But why? I mean, I think there's, there are two clear differences. Europe was hit by a very hard, much harder shock than America, gas prices and, and all the rest of it, much, much harder than America. And then America got the big fiscal stimulus. Those are the two key reasons. Monetary policy has done the same and, and, and everything else has not, have not really moved. The... Um, the curious thing is that that is not really appreciated as far as I can judge. The good news maybe is that you hear now a lot, I heard a lot of policymakers talk about it's red tape, too much restrictions in Europe. And that's true, but that didn't change the last two years, right? Yeah. But if, if, if we can get our top leaders to appreciate that Europe is over-regulated uh, and too much red tape, uh, then... That's certainly a good thing. Right? But, I mean, and this is also reflected, as you say, in the economy. I mean, valuations for stocks and yeah. everything. Does, yeah. does it make the ECB's job harder than, than the Fed and Bank of England? Um, yes, for sure. I, I mean, the heterogeneity in, in Europe makes it very complicated for the ECB. Uh, uh, but, as you know, I don't think that's the key issue at the ECB right now. The key issue for the ECB is that they see shadows on the walls, right? I mean, we saw Isabel Snapple's yeah. uh, interview earlier in the week. And it's, uh, inflation has come down. It's not all the way down yet. But we are, 
where America has a beautiful story and say, well, maybe it is so good, maybe we wait a little bit. In ECB, we wait a little because we could see maybe a little tick off. Like, so, so, so I think my problem with ECB is that they have tightened too much, and they, but, 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 but it's certainly a difficult job for sure. So let's go back to the Fed. Yeah. And first, we also, Tom Barkin was speaking yesterday from the Richmond uh, Fed. Here he is. Um, gratified to see inflation coming down, hoping it continues to come down, and I think we've got some time to be patient. If I could get these kind of numbers sustained and even better broadened, that's, that's what I'm looking for, sustained and broadening. See, Eric, I, I find it tricky because a lot of so the markets think that there's going to be cuts. I mean, yeah. they've kind of readjusted, but yeah. it was still cuts, 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 and they've already priced it in. Yeah. Then you had a lot of Fed president and saying, look, I don't know if they were scared of that U.S. jobs number or just in general, right. they don't really know what the picture for inflation looks like in the yeah. second half of the year. Yeah. No, I think that's a uh, – in America, it's, it's harder because there was a, a, a fairly big chunk of demand that pushed inflation up, but it has still come down really beautifully. Yeah. But I think – I mean, you see, see these, these uh, statements we've had the last uh, week or two. I mean, these guys are looking them at, the, at each other and say, we, they cannot believe the luck they had. All the debate, <laughs> all the debate about can we do a soft landing and all the stuff – that discussion is gone. They are looking at a beautiful picture. So, of course, they can take it easy. Of course, they can. Why try to, but, to risk anything right now? But so, Eric, so they're taking it easy because they have an easier life, or they're taking it easy because actually, it, you know, the last mile yeah. of taking inflation down to 2% is the hardest? Yeah, I don't buy that. Uh, I don't know why that necessarily. So, Philip Lane had a fantastic talk in, uh, uh, was it yesterday, the day before yesterday in America, mm -hmm. where he actually also analytically disputed this, but leave that aside. Uh, you're right, America, you know, the Fed has an easier task. The American economy is a lot, and a car that's a lot easier to drive than the European car for the reasons you mentioned. Yeah, but, it, but it's firing so, on all cylinders, which yeah. is quite extraordinary, yeah. right, give, given how much they've tightened. Yeah. Fiscal policy, right? They're running 7% deficit, double of, of Europe, and they've got the IRA and, and all the rest of it. It's like it's a, it is a... Uh, when you're pumping that type of money in, it is, it is amazing, right, uh, what it does. Uh, when do we worry about debt? I know, you know, a bit of the auctions. Like, I know yeah. traders are, like, holding on to their desk saying, oh, it's a 30-year. At, at some point, will, th will this backfire? Yes, of course. I mean, de I mean debt has to be sustainable. Uh, and I, I think it is, but, but that question is, is, is relevant. But it's America, right? It's the worst reserve currency. Um, I've heard for the last week or two, for the first time, people with, the, with regard to Trump, these questions, if he does a big tax cut, could we have a distrust moment in America? I, I don't think that's particularly likely because the, the U.S. Treasury market is so big and it's the global um, uh, reserve currency. So, so I, I don't think that's at all likely. It's not a zero probability, mm -hmm. right? But I... Um, so this is like U.S. exceptionalism continuing. It is U.S. exceptionalism. I mean, it, if the, under, there's a, the underlying story that the U.S. is an amazingly flexible economy. We knew this, right? So when you shock an economy that's flexible, it bounces better and faster than one that's not. We knew this, right? So that's at play. And then on top of that, we got Joe Biden's, you know, attempt at industrial policies or whatever. Long term, we can have this discussion. But we had this discussion over 10 years ago when we had austerity here and the Americans did, and, and those who were in favor of austerity in Europe, which gave us three, four years of underperformance also, not as bad as now, underperformance, the discussion was, yeah, but it's not going to last. It's short-term pain for long-term gain. But the long-term gain never came, yeah. right? Yeah. So we have, a, we have a real problem in Europe. We have a, and I think the problem is that on the fiscal policy, fundamentally, we have this, we have this pride. There's now we've got the fiscal rules more or less sorted out. That's a bottom-up discussion of, of, of accounting yes. issues. Yeah, exactly. And there is no discussion. Everybody agrees that defense spending may need to be 1 percentage points higher, 2 percent maybe, whatever it is, but it's a lot higher. Yeah. Everybody needs we need more for, for climate change. Everybody needs we need more for education, we need for this. But nobody cost it and then bring yeah. it down from top down. Yeah, so that's this, uh, structural. This is Eric, thank yeah. you. We'll come back and, and we'll talk about that sure. and also China. Staying with us um, for markets and the economy, Eric Nielsen, Group Chief Econ Economics Advisor at Unicredit. We'll talk China next, and this is Bloomberg. Well, 
Welcome back, everyone. Now, another wild week for Chinese stocks, and that's left investors yearning for more policy support. Meanwhile, there are concerns still that China's property slum could spread globally. Well, still with me, Eric Nielsen, Group Chief Econ Economics Advisor and Unicred. I'm still going to call you economist because I can't yeah, quite I am. get I'm an economist. I'm just advisor. call me an economist. Just um, <laughs> Eric, I mean... China, so we're in the Lunar New Year, and so there's going to, you know, they're going to be off for a couple of days. Yeah. But it, it, China's like still a mystery, yeah. actually, and certainly in, in terms of what the PBOC and what policymakers can do to try yeah. and, and stem and, and kind of stabilize not yeah. only markets but the economy. Yeah, they have a, I mean, the, the problem is huge in, in China in that sense. I mean, you have, a, you have the structural decline because of demographics, right? This, this we know, although they don't seem to appreciate it when you look at the, their, their growth expectations, forecast, or targets, or whatever you call them. Then you have this big, as you just mentioned, this big issue of the real estate side and, and deflation across the economy now. So, so uh, I mean, just as an order of magnitude, right, the debt they have in the real estate market and the banking that's related or the financial sector that's related with it, I, 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 last time I saw two, three times higher than it was in Parata terms to Spain and Ireland before the crisis. We have never seen these these leverage levels not ending in a crisis ever, right? Can China walk on water? Uh, maybe, but I wouldn't bet my money on it, right? So, it's a, so there is a long adjustment. The good news is that the Chinese government has money and power, right? But do we believe that they are better than, than the market economy to adjust it? I don't think so. So coming specific... But we used to think that... Yeah, we? yeah, because when you have had 20 years of 10% of, of growth, <laughs> you think they can walk on water, right? This is the issue, right? But, but reality is setting in. And, uh, and coming to your point, this is exactly the problem. So now, how do you stimulate? So what they do, as far as I can judge, is they start to pump money in, yeah. but they pump money in to the politically related companies, which are the big old industries, instead of the, the dynamic part of the economy. And that doesn't look good for the longer term. So I... Um, Eric, do, do you worry about commercial real estate in general? So it also, you know, yeah. there are a couple of bank troubles in the U.S. in yeah. the last week, and that seems to be spreading. I don't know whether you're worried about a, a financial stability or a credit event. Credit event. I mean, uh, look, we have had the biggest monetary policy shock in my living memory, right? It's uh, in, in, in the OECD area. To think we get through this with no sort of financial sector issue is hopeful, right? And I think... The good news is that, that Europe didn't have any issue apart from in Switzerland. Yeah. Right? And so, so that tells, gives a lot of credit to those who designed and implemented the adjustments after the financial crisis. So European banks, as far as I can judge, are yeah. in very fine shape. And the big American banks are. But then we have all the great stuff outside. I don't think it's reasonable to think that, I mean, we can always look at every, everything is possible, but it's not reason to think that that's systemic, right? Yeah. But credit events, I would be shocked if we don't get more. Eric, so interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Eric Nielsen, Group Chief Economics Advisor at Unicredit. I got it. I got yeah. it right this time. Coming <laughs> I up... i chase it next time. Yeah, after <laughs> L'Oreal's quarterly revenue fell short of estimates, it seems slow Chinese demand continues to be a problem. Hermes, though, reports strong sales and growth. We look at what the Bergen bag maker is doing different. We talk luxury next, and this is Bloomberg. Hermes has reported str strong quarterly sales growth as shares in the French fashion giant hit an all-time high this morning. Now, meanwhile, L'Oréal is struggling. That's after the cosmetic company reported sales that missed estimates due to cooling travel spending in China. Now, we're joined by Bloomberg opinion columnist Andrea Felstead. I love every column that Andrea writes. It's always interesting and always a little bit of a twist, so I urge everyone to go and, and read it. Um, Andrea, I mean, Hermes, if you speak to any luxury CEO, they want to be Hermes. And the numbers once again prove it. Like, how, how are they getting it so right? What they've done, they've achieved something that's very difficult to do. They've got the two iconic cam handbags, the Birkin and the Kelly, which everybody wants. There's a waiting list. They're hugely expensive. Trade for a lot more on the secondary market. 
but not everyone can get one or afford one. So what they've done is they've actually developed some other really nice handbags, which are quite popular, becoming more popular with the quiet luxury movements. So if you can't get a Birkin or a Kelly, you, you buy another bag. And what that hasn't done is detract from the popularity of those icons. They also introduced beauty, another way to access the brand without diluting it. They've managed to do all this and everyone still wants the bags. Uh, speaking of cosmetics, I mean, L'Oreal is struggling be because of the Chinese traveling market. That's right. I mean, across the sector, China hasn't come back as much as everyone was expecting. There's a, there's a big push to get people spending at home in, in um, Henan. Um, but the Chinese are, have started to travel a bit locally. What they're not doing is traveling to Europe again. So I know we're talking about luxury and, and cosmetics, and we have a little time, but it, like, is there a secret sauce to getting it right? Like pricing pressures, can, can you know, big luxury companies really afford to hike up prices 30% without hurting demand? What it, it's all about desirability. Every, on every call, every luxury conference call, they all say we want to increase the desirability of our products. And if you've got that desirability, you can charge a higher price. You can make things more exclusive. Andrea, as always, thank you so much. Andrea Felsch said they're our opinion columnist focused on luxury. We'll have plenty more throughout the day. We look at US inflation, we look at markets, and of course, we continue looking at luxury. This is Bloomberg. Joe Biden defends his mental fitness after a Justice Department report adds to concerns about the U.S. president's age. U.S. stocks hit another record with the S&P briefly topping 5,000 for the first time. The next catalyst for markets, CPI revisions later today. Plus, L'Oréal slumps after sales disappoint, hit by weak demand from Chinese travelers. But Hermes surges at its, as it weathers the luxury slowdown. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Well, Vladimir Putin says Russia has not achieved its objective in Ukraine as the war nears its two-year mark. Now, speaking to Tucker Carlson Network, the Russian president said he would consider negotiations only if the U.S. stops supplying weapons to Kiev. The Russian leader, who has overseen the jailing of several American journalists, was giving his first interview to Western media since the invasion of Ukraine. What we are conveying to the U.S. leadership, if you really want to stop fighting, you need to stop supplying weapons. It will be over within a few weeks. That's it. And then we can agree on some terms. Meanwhile, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has given his State of the Nation address as the country prepares for the tightest elections since the end of apartheid. We have laid a foundation for growth through far-reaching economic reforms that we have embarked upon. An, an ambitious investment drive and an infrastructure program that is starting to yield results. Now for more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Jennifer Zavazaja. Jen, always good to have you uh, on with us. So what's the reaction to the State of the Nation address been? Yeah, Fran, uh, good to be on the show. You know, the reaction's been relatively muted and, and a bit disappointing, especially if you take a look at some of the uh, the uh, newspapers. This one has uh, a hollow speech devoid of truth. And then we also have the Mail and Guardian, which says Cyril spooks and stagnation. Uh, and I'm just showing that just to uh, give you, illustrate really uh, what the reaction has been. Last night we saw this speech uh, about two hours long with the president largely defending the 30 years of ANC rule, which is the African National Congress uh, and, you know, not really walking us through a, a lot of policy changes or things that he's planning on doing uh, to sort of turn the country back to where uh, back to where he says it, it should be and it can be. Uh, he did walk the nation though through what he believes it, it are the successes of the ANC which includes broadening access to education and health care. He also uh, talked about a new climate change response response fund and a pledge to overhaul the nation's health care system. But you know outside of, of that you know he talked a bit about the struggles that the country has gone through, but also alluded to the fact that a, a number of countries go through struggles uh, and that under the ANC, they have been better off. Black South Africans have been better off and the country more largely has been better off. But, you know, if you take a look at the electorate and the things that the electorate has had to go through over the past few years, uh, it, it, it's kind of a tough sell. 
And Ramaphosa's office, uh, Jen, has also said that he will announce a date for elections this year by the end of February. Yeah. So how's that shaping up? Yeah, many people were expecting him to potentially make that announcement last night. He did not, uh, but he does have uh, a bit more time to make that announcement. Look, the, the plan, the, the real the meat of this is that this was the last state of the nation uh, before the election happens. And so many mm -hmm. analysts were going into this assuming that the president would talk more about the, uh, you know, the economy, uh, which many people are struggling with. Nearly 32 percent unemployment. Uh, we've had electricity shortages. There's also been logistical challenges, uh, which have set the economy back largely. And so the expectation was that he was going to go into it, but did not go into it. And it's not just that. There's also uh, a lot of people who are expecting the ANC potentially to lose their majority in this election election, uh, which would be significant uh, for the economy and significant considering uh, the 30 years that they have been in the majority. Uh, and so, you know, we didn't hear the president focus too much on that, but instead just trying uh, to really convince people that the ANC is the one to lead this economy. Uh, and not really helping the situation, Fran, is the fact that we've seen a weakening RAND. Uh, we've also seen commodity prices uh, drop. And so uh, a lot of economists are waiting to get a little bit of direction. So now we're pivoting to uh, the budget speech, which is coming later this month from the finance minister. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we'll get some indications of where this economy is headed. Jen, thanks so much. As always, Jennifer Zabazaja there with the very latest, of course, on South Africa. Now, shares and dollar bonds have fallen in Pakistan today as a country's vote count faces lengthy delays. The widely expected outcome of a return to power to for three-time Premier Nawaz Sharif is looking lesser. The party of jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan, whose candidates have been forced to run as independents, is claiming a shock victory. But Sharif's supporters are also claiming a win, raising the prospect of instability in the country. So let's take a look at some of the corporate news as well, ExxonMobil plans to leave Equatorial Guinea within months, ending almost three decades of oil drilling that made the country an OPEC member. The small West African nation became one of the world's hottest oil provinces around the turn of the century. But output has since dried up along with foreign investment. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Saudi Arabia is set to hire banks, including Citi, Goldman and HSBC, for a secondary share sale in Aramco. The world's biggest oil exporter is also set to be in talks with other banks as it pulls together the offer that may come in the next few weeks. Now, the follow-on offering would raise about $20 billion, making it among the biggest in recent years. Bloomberg also understands that the electric car battery venture steered by Stellantis and Mercedes is close to raising 4.4 billion euros in debt to finance its European expansion. Now, automotive sales company is also in talks with several banks and could announce a debt deal soon. Battery plants are key for Europe's efforts to step up a local supply chain to rival Asia. Coming up, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer says there is an attractive option to rejuvenate the UK stock market. We'll have more on our fireside chat with Jeremy Hunt. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, shares in chip designer Arm soared in New York after the company boosted its forecast in a blockbuster earnings report. In an interview with Bloomberg Technology, the chief executive, Rene Haas, says Arm is poised to be a key beneficiary of the AI boom. This is really the results of strategies that were put in place a number of years ago that are now just really starting to come to fruition. Yeah. When we think about the vindication, when we think, though, still about basically more of your technology going into more types of equipment, you've managed to see a diversification out of phones. Paint us the strategy of ARM going forwards, because many would say, actually, you're not just well, the overall designer of chips. You're basically making the chips. You're fabulous in some way. Is, how do you see that relationship going forward with Qualcomm, for example? Well, a lot of folks, you know, as you said, um, didn't really understand the company well and, and where we fit. And, and obviously, we had a lot of growth attached to the smartphone market. But ARM is in a lot of devices that people may not naturally think about. Uh, we're in a Tesla vehicle. We're in a Ford F-150. We're in a uh, Ring smart camera. We're in a Samsung TV, a Samsung smart appliance. 
So just about every device you can think of uh, has ARM inside, and just about every device you can think of needs more and more compute, particularly as, as AI is now driving a whole new demand cycle. Mm. Talk to us about AI. Jeffrey is really singling that out. The analysts there saying that this really shows you're a beneficiary from AI. But where does the AI focus come? You, of course, were at NVIDIA before. They are all about AI accelerators. And I'm interested as to whether or not that would be an area that you get into other than servers. Well, right now, NVIDIA is a great partner. Uh, their Grace Hopper chip, a super chip, uses uh, a lot of ARM CPUs in combination with their GPU which is a really, really great solution for uh, high-end AI training in the data center, as well as inference. But when you start moving to smaller devices, say smartphones or PCs, well, AI is going to run there too. Uh, if you look at some of the recent announcements by, by Samsung and Google relative to their smartphones, there's a lot of things such as circling an image on a browser and then having that browser go off and do search based on the, uh, the circle. That's AI. That's actually running in a smartphone. And what we're seeing is really a drive for more and more compute capacity to run these AI algorithms, some that people don't even know what they are yet. But what designers want to do and need to do is future-proof their designs with more and more compute. And that is really driving a, a strong uh, licensing cycle for us in terms of more demand. Well, that was the ARM chief executive Werner Haas speaking to Bloomberg Technology. Now, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, told me in a fireside chat that he's very attracted to the idea of creating a tax-free savings account for investing in British stocks. Now, he would form part of his Conservative Party's efforts to boost the UK's struggling stock market ahead of the next general election. Well, let's discuss all of this with the UK government reporter, Joe Mays, who's been following this very, very closely. So, Joe, good morning. The Chancellor, of course, facing calls to create this tax incentive for British investors, is it any closer to reality? And does the city actually think it will have a big impact? Well, last night he seemed to suggest that it is something the Treasury is strongly considering. We thought he might do it at the autumn statement in November. He didn't, which just disappointed some in the city, but it looks like it's still very much on the table. I mean, one key question is, is there the money to do it? That's always the question uh, with, with Chancellor Budget. He was saying to you last night, I haven't got the final numbers from the OBR. I don't know how much money I'll have to play with. And he's clearly got a big shopping list of things he'd like to do, such as cutting income tax or cutting national insurance further. So the British ISA will kind of be part of that mix. It, it might be prioritised. We'll have to see how that goes. Would it make an impact? Well, some in the city clearly feel it would. You know, the demand side in the UK stock market has clearly been a point of weakness. And if you could boost that, then that could have that knock-on positive effect. But, you know, there are bigger structural issues facing UK equities. Maybe this wouldn't be, you know, a massive game-changer. I think it would help. And certainly that's why asset managers have been calling for it. But again, Joe, I guess the problem is that is this just going to be a budget for, you know, people to vote Tory at the next election? I mean, it changes everything because there has to be an election in the next 12 months and they're really far behind in polls. Yes, I think you're right. And therefore, that would suggest that Jeremy Hunt would prioritise any kind of fiscal measures, whether that be tax cuts, which have the biggest impact in terms of electoral gain for the Conservative Party. And that would suggest perhaps doing more things like an income tax cut or reducing national insurance further, rather than something more specific in the world of finance, as a British ISO might be. He might be wrong, but I think that, as you, as you, as you say, uh, the, the electoral pressure is strong and the money is tight. So this is a tricky one. So let's also turn to, to the big politics story of the week, which is Labour and Keir Starmer, you know, uh, and his green rollback. How damaging is it for the, for the opposition Labour Party? It's a hard one to say in that, on one hand, clearly it doesn't help Labour's reputation for being kind of consistent, always sticking to its word. On the other hand, I think Keir Starmer would argue that it's taking a kind of target off their back, which the Conservative Party was kind of relentlessly hitting, saying that you, know, you can't be trusted with the nation's finances, you're going to borrow £28 billion. I think he'd be quite happy to kind of shrug that off and say, look, that, that attack doesn't really apply anymore because we have this new, much more scaled backpack, only £4.7 billion yet. A big reduction from that 28. And and he, and he can flip the argument and say, look, we are being very honest with you as, as the electorate. Look, we cannot do this. The public finances have deteriorated since we made that pledge. They blame the Conservative Party and uh, kind of the Liz Trust era particularly. And therefore, you know, try and turn to a positive of them and say, look, you can now trust us and we're going to be safe with, the pub, with, with, with public finances. So it, it, you can argue it both ways. But Joe, and, and you and Phil Aldrich have done some you know, great work mathematically on actually how much, again, fiscal room there is space. I mean, whoever is in power will, will just struggle to find the money. So the money has to come from somewhere, right? 
Yes, exactly. And I mean, I was with the, in the briefing yesterday with Keir Starmer, and he was saying to the press, he was saying, look, the Treasury and, and Jeremy Hunt are likely to really push the envelope at the next budget for the reasons we just talked about because of that electoral pressure. So to the point where tax cuts will happen and, and public spending might get cut, for example, so that any inheritance Labour would have if they do win the election would be very tight and to the point where they might have to you know, reverse tax cuts and try and increase public spending. You know, where is this money going to come from? You're exactly right to ask that question. And that's why it's just such a, it could be so yeah. difficult for them to do any of their plans. And that's why we saw this massive reduction on the, on the green spending pledge. Yeah, Joe, as always, thank you so much. Uh, great, of course, work there from you and the team. Joe Mays from our UK government team. Now, veteran emerging markets investor Mark Mobius says Hong Kong and China shares are becoming attractive due to return ratios, earnings and debt. Mobius was speaking in an interview with Bloomberg. And I think they're going to see some good opportunities now because the Hong Kong market, as you can see, has been driven down to very, very low levels. Of course, it could go lower, but we're now beginning to see people make comparisons with India and China and Hong Kong, of course, and begin to think, hey, maybe India has gone too far up and there's an opportunity for Hong Kong China side stocks to perform. Uh, I'm not predicting that, but I think people are beginning to look at the valuations, are beginning to think that perhaps there's going to be a good opportunity there. The Chinese officials are trying their best to uh, regain confidence, get get people to be confident again. But you must remember, at the end of the day, it's the Chinese investors who drive the Chinese market, not foreign investors. So the first uh, order of business will be for them to uh, instill confidence in the in Chinese investors' minds. Uh, but I think that will eventually come once this housing problem is over. It'll take some time, but as you know, most Chinese uh, investors have a lot of money in their property, more than in stocks. Well, that was Mark Mobius, chief executive and founder of Mobius AI Investments, speaking to Bloomberg. Coming up, Las Vegas is getting ready to host America's most watched sporting spectacle. That's, of course, the Super Bowl. Now a billion-dollar business or billion-dollar businesses, a new class of investors circling for football team's ownership. We discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg. So Walt Disney's ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers are joining forces to launch a sports-focused streaming service. It will feature major college and pro games, usually seen only on traditional TV. Earlier, the chief financial officer, Hugh Johnston, joined Bloomberg to talk about the company's new joint venture. The focus when you do a three-way JV is on how do we make sure that we, we get the operating principles right so that the parties are aligned up front and they're aligned on going and delivering a great product to consumers. And that, that's the real focus here is how do we make it easier and reduce friction for the sports fans? So uh, we're going to get to pricing shortly. We'll get to a name at, at some point, I'm sure. But what's most important is I think we're going to deliver a product that's going to make your life a whole lot better if you're a sports consumer. Hugh, do you think that ultimately the idea of a bundle going back to the future and getting people uh, with reduced friction to find their sports team and find the game that they want to watch is going to take eyeballs away from some of the other providers, the cable networks that have traditionally had these contracts? So you're going to bid directly on some of these sports rights. Well, I, I think it's going to be targeted more at, at people who either were never in, in the cable bundle or people who had already departed from the cable bundle. You know, at the margins, might there be a little bit of shifting? Yeah, there could be. But to tell you the truth, I don't think sports is going to be the reason that someone makes that shift all by itself. I think there are a lot of factors that weigh into that. From our perspective, we're focused on meeting the fan wherever they choose to be. I don't think we're motivating the fan to move. But if the fan does move, we want to be there because we want ESPN to be everywhere. Hugh, we're super interested in how you're going to bid for those sporting rights. Do you think you might bid for them as a joint venture? How's this going to work in the months and years to come? No, quite the opposite. Uh, we all will be bidding independently. And that, that's something that, that we're quite firm on is that is not the purpose of the venture. The purpose of the venture is purely distribution. It's not about procurement of content. So we'll continue to compete with each other for sports rights, just as we always have. Uh, it'll actually, I think, be a great benefit to the league because 
it's no different in terms of the way we bid for sports rights, but that reduced friction benefits all of the leagues as well. So I think the leagues will actually be pretty optimistic about this. Well, that was uh, Hugh Johnston, the Disney chief financial officer. Now, it's Super Bowl weekend. Everyone's so excited in the newsroom. Today's Big Take looks at a different side of America's biggest sporting event, once treated as heirlooms, while pro football franchises are now billion-dollar businesses and a new class of investors is circling. Let's go to Bloomberg's Charlie Wells, who joins us now. I mean, we're kind of obsessed with the Super Bowl. As Europeans, you kind of think it's really a show, and so it's about the, the you know, ushers playing, and it's a real, like, show what Americans do best. But if you look at the National Football, League. There's also investors wanting to go in. Like, what do we know about the, you know, the next wave of succession? Yeah, well, Francine, as you say, it's a show, but it's also a show business, and <laughs> it is a billion-dollar business. I mean, the NFL's revenue last year was twenty billion dollars. And look, I'm not a quarterback, but I do love a good story. And today's big take <laughs> is really good, and it focuses on this kind of family succession problem that we're seeing in the NFL. And something that's really unique about the NFL is it has been very family-oriented, very family ownership-oriented, especially compared to a lot of sports. I mean, until the 1980s, a single individual had to own 51% of a team. So we're slowly seeing some of that change. We're seeing some of the tax implications of trying to pass on these teams through generations. And we're seeing some people potentially want to sell to private equity and private equity being very open to that. So private equity, are they doing because it's, it's jewels and it's fun and it's famous? Or is it actually because they, they want to make money out of it? Can they make money out of it? I would say there's a little bit of both. I mean, we've seen huge appreciation in these teams. I mean, um, you know, from 2020 to 2023, uh, some of the, the, these franchises on average, they're, they appreciated 70%. The average team in the NFL is worth $5 billion. And if you're thinking about this from kind of a private equity perspective, you know, you see a business where there's been kind of mom and pop owners, right? but that are incredibly lucrative. Maybe there's some management issues and then potential rule changes. And so this looks like a prime opportunity. But as you say, it's also really fun. It's kind of cool to say that you have some ownership in an NFL team. It is. It's like a jewel in the crown. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like it's like the thing that it, it's good at a party, basically, to, to put that into conversation. What does an NFL owned by private equity look like? Well, it probably looks like a lot of different kind of sports teams. You know, in the U.S., you do have, you know, more private investors in um, baseball, in hockey. I know we know that in, fo you know, European football and soccer, um, you do see a lot of this. You see, you know, player salaries in other sports teams just like escalating, whereas in football, those salaries are actually fairly well controlled. So you could see some serious changes. A lot of these families, you know, some of them do want to offload to private equity, but some, wanna, some of them want to retain that control. And that there is this element of being a part of the community. You get kind of local celebrities buying in at sometimes. You get former, you know, stars from some of these teams owning these owning parts of these businesses. And so that could change. So you're watching the Super Bowl. Even I'm kind of tempted. Yeah. More for the for the like the, the party with friends aspect. It's an extravaganza. It is an ushers. I mean, I do mean, we know who else is 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 singing? It's all about Usher, right? It's you know, you, you can't I compete. Agree. Charlie Wells, always spot on. Thank you so much also for bringing the business side of, of uh, what is going to be a fun Super Bowl. You can read today's big take on the NFL's succession challenge on your Bloomberg terminal. Up next, a Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger, Manish Kranny in New York, and this is Bloomberg.